every year we learn more and more and more about our universe. It is absolutely unreal how quickly and how much we learn. Uh, we learn more about the math of our universe, the science, the physical, the seen, sometimes the unseen. Some, some things that we can observe and we can test and we can do all kinds of cool stuff to figure out if, if it's actual or not. Some things literally are mathematicians working away at math and figuring out how our universe works. And once they figure something out, they go, wow, that is fascinating. Now let's see if we can predict what's going to happen based on that math. And then they go and test it. But, but most of our really big scientific ideas are some string of line of mathematics that looks like a foreign language. And then they start go, they go and test it and figure out, well, how can we observe this? Can we figure this out? And it is, it is actually quite impressive. And then there are some other things that somebody like Einstein almost 100 years ago says, I think this is how things work. We don't have the math. We don't necessarily know why, but this is what I think is going to come out. And then 100 year la years later, we find out actually we can prove that. Or there was another theory going around, I'm going to come back to later, that, that Einstein said there's no way that's how the universe works. And uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, a lab test tested it and, uh, and found it to be accurate. So sometimes he, he missed the mark. But uh, it is absolutely phenomenal how much we learn every year. And for so long, too long, Christianity has just run in the opposite direction of science. As fast as we can go, avoiding every kind of uh, molecule of information out there, and, and some kind of fear that it might explain something that the Bible doesn't explain, or it, it might explain something that is supposed to be in awe and wonderment. But the reality is, for me, I'll speak on my behalf, for the reality is that the more we learn, the more awesome and wondrous and just utterly unbelievable things are. I was reading something on, on words the other day, and, and we use these words like amazing and awesome in everyday sentences. And then and the question was posed, uh, so what happens when something actually is amazing? And that's where we're at with some of the science and some of the things that we look out into the universe and we can know what's going on is that we say, wow, that's, that's amazing. But not like my hamburger was amazing. Oh, <laughs> my hamburger wasn't amazing, but my veggie burger was amazing. And, and not like that, but, but something truly awesome and, and unfathomable. Your body is made up of... You ready for this? Count, somebody count the zeros for me. A billion, billion, billion carbon atoms. Look at your hand and start counting the carbon atoms until you get to a billion, billion, billion. And then every other person in this room is also made of something like a billion, billion, billion atoms carbon atoms on top of other things. But, but carbon alone makes up this huge percentage of, of life on Earth. And it's not just uh, people, it's, it's everything living. Everything that, that breathes and, and has life and uh, grows and has a lifespan and dies and renews, all of that is through this, through, with not... All of that is not possible without the carbon atom. I don't want to go too far into this because it can be upsetting. <laughs> but on top of that, okay, we have, uh, we have this DNA, right? And we've all heard of DNA. We talk about, well, can we modify DNA? Can we do this and that? But every living thing on our planet has DNA. DNA tells uh, molecules what to do. 
and how to grow and how it's supposed to look. We share DNA. This is where it gets a little off-putting. We share DNA with everything living on earth. And it depends on how you're doing the math, because it can be done different ways, like statistics. It depends on how you're doing the math, but somewhere, uh, you know, something like, well, let's have fun, something like a, a rice plant, okay? We share somewhere between 15 and 25%, how you're doing the math, DNA with a rice plant. Now you have to ask yourself, how, is, how, does, how does DNA take the same carbon atoms and the same cellular structures and make something so completely different and we, we borrow from each other in that process? There is something that we can't quite explain about the way life works. And scientists are working really hard to explain it. That's why we're studying DNA. That's why we study where these carbon atoms come from, which is where we're going to turn to next. And what's phenomenal about this is that in each level or each layer of complexity that we learn about life or that we learn about the makeup of atoms and elements and the, and the universe, we learn something new. And each time, more than the last, I, I get a layer deeper into the science and I go... Wow, that is one creative God. And that's what I do. We, we looked in week two, we looked at creativity. And as, almost as God acting as the force of creativity, not just putting a hand on it, but acting as the force of creativity. I like to think about it like that because you see things that happen that are so complex in terms of DNA molding and structuring a, a, a body or a, an animal or something like that. Oh, we didn't, do we didn't do the mouse. The mouse is really crazy. Somewhere between 85 and 90% is what we're talking about and shared DNA with a mouse. That's why we get to do such cool lab tests with them and figure out what's actually going to happen. Anyway, uh, so much complexity and, and God at work in the center of it. Or we can run from it and go, well, that's not true. We don't share anything with a mouse. But, but so much complexity here, and we can see God working in the creative process of the universe that, that is constantly renewing. We're going to go one more step here with this carbon thing because it is fascinating. And uh, the title's not up there, but today is Elements. And, and what we know, okay, about our sun... Our sun is burning, and on the outside, it's burning gas, and on the outside of the surface of the sun, something like 600,000 degrees Celsius. But what we know about making, creating at, uh, atoms of different types, so we, we have carbon, we have uh, some of the he heavier elements, iron and, and different metals and things like this, all of that requires energy to create. What happens is, is you take hydrogen and helium, or two, two elements, and you smash them together so hard and so fast in such a, a chaotic process that they fuse together. Or that they sh some things go off one way and some things form something new. But it requires such a great amount of energy to do that, something like the sun, to create those things. But that 600,000 degrees doesn't get us into the heavier elements. Every time we get a heavier element, it takes more mass and more uh, energy to create it. So we have to get creative and going, well, where did this, all of this carbon, because carbon is, is slightly heavier than what our sun can, can produce, and so where did this come from? A physicist will tell you that every one of those billion, billion, billion carbon atoms in your body and everyone else's was created in the process of a star dying. that 
that's cool, right? <laughs> that the matter in the physical form, ev everything we're looking at that, that has a physicality to it, is created in the process of a star imploding on itself and creating such pressure and such force and such energy that it, it forms these complex fusion processes that create different atoms. And one of those in the earlier stages is carbon atoms, which is the, one of the building blocks for life here on Earth. Now, I don't know about you, but I look at that and go, wow. And it's one of those moments where you say, I could use a word here that I just used for a veggie burger, but it doesn't quite make sense. I can use a word here that I try to talk about God as creativity, but that's not enough. That's not enough of what's happening in the process of a, a star imploding and creating such energy that, that the heaviest elements in our, not just here, but across our galaxy, across the solar system, all of these formed in this moment. And I can't wrap my head around what that says about a God who uses the creative process. The sun actually can only do a certain amount because it's so small. If we look uh, a little bit further in our galaxy, the closest uh, star to us that, that has the magnitude to create some of these heavier elements is Betelgeuse. You heard the Betelgeuse? Looked at Betelgeuse? You can look at uh, Orion just above, if you look out in the night sky, and I'm going to see it there, just above Orion's belt, the three stars that cross, is, there's an elbow right here, and he's got his elbow here. You can see Betelgeuse right here, and it's this, it's this red star in the sky. It's usually one of the brightest stars in the sky because it's so close to us and because it's so big. So our star, uh, the sun, is, is quite large compared to us, and we look at it and go, that's pretty amazing. Uh, Jupiter is so large that it would reach, if it was placed where the sun is, it would reach all the way uh, to Jupiter. Betelgeuse is so large, sorry. Betelgeuse is so large that it would reach all the way to Jupiter. That's the kind of mass that is needed to create some of these heavier elements in our cosmos, galaxy, creation, everything, right? I can't help but notice in this moment how deeply everything is connected. You think about the stars creating uh, or, or being part of the creative process to, to create carbon atoms and life that comes from that and everything. And I can't help but think about everything we see being bound up together in the creative process. Actually, Paul talks about this. He doesn't quite have the words to talk about the, the carbon atoms and the, the stardust and, and the supernova that... that Betelgeuse is going to create, but, but he does have some words to talk about it. You see, we like to think about, and we've done this forever, we like to think about ourselves as the center of the universe. How do you not? I mean, in, in, in philosophical terms, like each one of us is the center of our own universe, if you will. We don't need to do that. <laughs> Um, so, but Paul talks about this in a, in a way that, that I absolutely love. And I come back to it over and over because we, we focus so centrally on humanity and on ourselves in talking about uh, creation. Sometimes we don't get further than, our, than ourselves when we're talking about creation. Sometimes we don't get further than, than the mountains that we can see ourselves when we talk about creation. But when Paul talks about creation and God redeeming and the process that's coming, he says, uh, we're in chapter 8 of Romans, he says, for, well, I'll back up one verse. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory 
about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but of the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. What I love about this is that that pain and suffering that we experience is that Paul has, has placed that into the process of creation so that, so that we get a sense of where we belong sort of on a cosmic scale, that we are all in this together. And I think if that star is creating all of the mass and matter and everything, and we are so tightly connected to the universe around us, then Paul has something going for him. Paul has figured out something really deep about the connectivity between us and the mountain and us and the rest of God's creation near and far. And he says, for the creation waits with eager longing in hope that it itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The, uh, <clears throat> the Message Bible puts it a little bit differently and what I like about it, whether, I can, whether it's appropriate or not, <laughs> what I like about it is that it talks about the birthing pains not as much in terms of trying to explain the pain, but almost in terms of trying to explain where creation is headed, that something new is being created. So rather, I'll just read it. Rather than... Uh, give me one second here. It's coming. We know that the whole creation has been groaning. That's the NIV. We don't want that. <laughs> we know all around us we observe a pregnant creation. And that's a different statement than we are observing a, a creation experiencing pain. That is a statement of what God is doing and coming to next. That redeeming process is a, is a creative process that, that is just like in the, the process of creating life. That is a creative process in redeeming all of the cosmos. That point may be lost because it's, uh, I may not be getting there, but, but this is all of everything happening and connected, whether it's DNA or carbon atoms or elements. We look out into the night sky, and we actually, there's a, a group of women that, uh, that did the cataloging for some huge percentage of the sky. Basically, you can identify by, uh, with a, a prism, basically, you can divide the light from each star and see the colors that are coming from it. And you can identify in those colors what elements are in each star. And so we've cataloged a huge number of stars. And we know that the, the 92 elements that we have here are the same elements that are across the galaxy and across, uh, across the observable universe, we'll say. That's, that's fascinating. That connects us deeply, not just to uh, across the globe or across the solar system, but across the cosmos. We are deeply connected, and that's the kind of God that works and connects all living things and all life and all creation. In the moment of that star destruction, 
we find a moment where God shows us the connection between all of the created order. And that's what Paul was trying to find for us, is that statement about us longing with creation to be redeemed. So when we talk about salvation, when we talk about the redeeming process, nothing is more beautiful than looking out into the cosmos and thinking about the power and movement and creativity of God reaching across all of the created order and saying, all of this is coming under my hand. All of this is to be redeemed with me. We think about pain. We think about uh, the life and rebirth uh, of the renewal of the seasons, the, the movement of, we don't want to go too far with this, but the carbon atoms that, that when, we, when we pass become part of something else. That is a, a renewal process in life. And that same renewal process that happens in the stars happens here with us. And it, and it is so fitting. This is where I want to... This is where I want to go with our, with our statement here. It is so fitting that a God who uses the, the renewal of life in our universe to create, to sustain, to create new life, to find new, uh, new stars, all of these things that happen in this, in this moment of supernovas and, and fusion processes, that God is using the renewal of matter to create and in this redeeming process, God is using the redemption of all of us to renew and to bring us back to God. God is a God of renewal, a God of creativity. And it's not just the stars and it's not just the elements. It is the process of God renewing us almost on a daily basis, almost and certainly on a weekly basis, I find myself here feeling renewed, feeling a, a process of, I don't want to call it rebirth, but, but a, a process of, of newness and of life that happens again and again as we fail and as we come back to the table that God is constantly there to renew. And the statement from Paul, what this the fuller statement from Paul is that it's not just, it's not just a, a weekly thing or a daily thing, but ultimately, ultimately all of creation around us, all around we observe a pregnant creation. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pangs. But it's not only all around us, it is within us. The Spirit of God is arousing us within and we also are feeling those birth pangs. And the creation itself is to be renewed in all of its glory. That is the process of redemption that we can't quite get our heads around. And that's the moment when we go, wow, that is awesome. And we mean it, not like a veggie burger. Or amazing, or grace-filled, or we have so many words that all fall short. And that's what, that's what wonders are all about, is to look up and see everything in the created order being renewed and being fulfilled in God's time, in God's place, in, in, in and with God. <clears throat> 